Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 116 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO, Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another fantastic interview episode where we pull up a seat with some of the best and brightest in the spirits and cocktail world and pick their brains for all to hear. This time around, I'm joined by John Ravis of Maximo Mezcal, a really interesting new Mezcal brand that's making a splash here in D.C. and beyond. But before we start talking about things like espadine, terroir, and open fermentation, let's take this opportunity for you to make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the Mezcal Manhattan. Now, I guess you're probably thinking, isn't that just a Manhattan made with Mezcal instead of rye whiskey? Well, yeah, but there's two really specific things I like about this cocktail using this particular spirit. One is that you can learn something about a spirit when you put it through the filter of your favorite cocktail. So if you were a Manhattan person, this might be your go-to move for a new bourbon or rye, for example, but a Mezcal, now that's different. Normally, you'd compare a Mezcal Manhattan to a Rob Roy, which is a Manhattan made with smoky scotch, right? There's the the smokiness from the Mezcal, kind of makes sense in that comparison. But this leads us to another thing I really enjoy about this use case, especially for Maximo Mezcal. Later in the interview, we nose and taste this spirit, and John walks us through the production process step by step to reveal why it tastes the way it does. It retains the agave character with hints of smoke, but overall, it's definitely a bourbon or a rye drinker's spirit. So why shouldn't we use it in an American whiskey cocktail? To make a Mezcal Manhattan, you'll need two ounces of Maximo Mezcal, one ounce sweet vermouth, I used Carpano Antica, and several dashes of our embitterment orange bitters. Combine these ingredients in a mixing glass with ice, stir for about 20 seconds until well chilled and diluted, strain into a stemmed cocktail glass, and garnish with a lemon twist. This last little departure from the traditional Manhattan formulation is a really fitting finish for this south of the border riff. The lemon gives it a brighter flavor profile than the traditional orange peel, and it gives a nod to the move that most people automatically think to do when working with agave spirits, which is to douse them in citrus juice. Because this bottle is so special, and because the Manhattan is such a classy, restrained cocktail, I think it's only appropriate that we honor the classic moves, but also make room for new ways of doing things. So now that you're all fueled up and ready for our journey south of the border, let's turn our attention back to the conversation at hand. In this spirited interview with John Ravis of Maximo Mezcal, some of the topics we cover include how John made the move from shucking oysters to tending bar to consulting in the business world to ultimately helping found a Mezcal brand designed to elevate the American palate. Why Maximo Mezcal is as much a DC brand as it is Oaxacan. How the Mezcaleros and funders behind Maximo Mezcal have balanced tradition with innovation, especially when it comes to their production methods. Why barbecue is a great analogy for anyone trying to understand the various roasting procedures in agave spirits. A few little hacks to help you understand bottle design and pricing in the tequila and mezcal world. Where we plan to grab drinks with restaurant mogul Danny Meyer and much, much more. This was a real treat of an interview, and John is a great guy who's super passionate about bringing excellent agave spirits to the U.S., I know you'll enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoyed recording it. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to present this conversation with John Ravis of Maximo Mezcal. 
John, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Eric. Yeah. Can you introduce yourself to our guests and uh, just give us a little 10 second bio on John? Of course. My name is John Ravis. I'm one of the founders of Maximo Mescal. And myself, like other industry professionals, stumbled upon the hospitality industry and never left. Uh, started uh, working behind the bar when I was taking the summer off down in Dewey and stayed a little bit longer than had anticipated. You know, I planned on going back to Boston and working in finance, but fell in love with bartending. So I um, was kind of helping out a, a private equity group down there, and they were in, investing in bars, hotels, and restaurants all over the country. And one of the partners had a tequila project come to them, and we were able to kind of grow them a little bit more, but ended up that this brand had some legal issues, so couldn't really move forward with the tequila brand that we had. And at the same time, my, my now current partners, Henry Gettinar and Lamberto Camacho, had been talking about building a mezcal, a mezcal brand, and Lamberto had been forwarding Henry some projects, and we all were able to meet up and start talking about building Maximo. Yeah, and first of all, great name for a mezcal, right? <laughs> <laughs> we wanted something short and something that people were able to pronounce. We felt like the market was kitschy and we wanted people to not feel nervous about how they were going to order their mezcal. So something short and sweet. And it happens to be that Henry's son, his name is Maximilian. So it was kind of uh, a nice way to tie everything together. Yeah, absolutely. So you spent some time working in Dewey. You said, were you a bartender? I started out shucking oysters, shucking oysters, yeah. and then slinging drinks. You, you were, I imagine, in the in the like tourist setting. You're probably not sitting there like taking five minutes to stir and build one, right? Exactly. No, we had a lot, a lot of cosmos, pomegranate margaritas, and and all the all the beach cocktails you could think of. So it wasn't for a couple of years later did I really get into to craft cocktails. Once we got to the city and really got to experience that. Yeah, I find that, um, so, so my wife is from South Jersey and uh, Philly is like, so Philly flocks to South Jersey, and but then I found that DC flocks to the Delaware beaches. So it's it's interesting how like these East Coast cities that are slightly inland have this, this kind of uh, like weird exerted pressure. Escape, yeah. yeah. It's it, but but you do you very much do find that like each city has like its particular stretch of beaches <laughs> yeah. that they go to. And I find that so fascinating. So so talk talk a little bit more about this migration from this like okay I'm a beach bartender. I started working, you know, with, with these folks who were were trying to take this tequila brand to market. There were some issues, and then you made your way to DC to talk us through that transition a little bit more because I, I like the story. Yeah, definitely. So I um, was traveling a lot for for work. This group was called Tidewater, and you know had to be at an airport, and it was three hours from Delaware to get to any airport. So I was like, I, I need to be closer. So DC was the next logical move, and you know I was working from home or traveling. So I always had kept a, a bartending role in the city as kind of a an outlet to, to socialize. Um, so I first started at the Bourbon over in Glover Park several, several years ago. Um, rest in peace now. Yeah. But that was my, my foray into craft cocktails. Awesome. Yeah. So, so you had this full-time gig doing kind of like more of the consulting, consulting, yeah. corporate kind of like, you know, suit, suit and tie type deal. And, and then you were also at the same time kind of moonlighting as a bartender. Yeah, it was it was an industry that I'd loved, uh, you know, and fell in love with at the beach and, and kind of wanted to always keep one foot in, in that industry it was, you know, the connections I had made from behind the bar. All, all over the place. Yeah, it, it is a very like, well, especially because bartenders are so itinerant. You know, you find that, you know, all right, you'll meet somebody in DC, but then, you know, in five years, they'll pop up somewhere else down the line. Exactly. You know, so it really does. It's it's a cool, like, if you want a life hack to try and build a, a national network of friends, <laughs> just meet a lot of bartenders because they'll be in and a Everyone city. knows everyone. Right, exactly. It's a great way to travel too because <laughs> then they'll, they'll let you crash with them, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so agave spirits are... A hot, I will, we'll call it hot right now. It's, it's one of the segments of the spirits industry that's experiencing the most growth. Maybe, maybe you know, I'm, I'm not directly no, tapped definitely. into that, but it, it's certainly experiencing a higher level of growth than most uh, segments of the spirit industry. And so I'm curious about how you got into agave in particular, because it is a very specific thing. It's grown in only a very specific portion of the world when compared to something like 
grain-based whiskey. Grain can grow pretty much anywhere in the subtropics. Uh, same with grapes, same with fruit for brandies. But agave is like this very specific thing. So uh, how did you get into agave and, and what do you think about that crazy growth that's happening right now? Yeah, so just like the bartending industry is a very tight-knit community, so is the Mexican agave uh, producers family. So our, our partner, Lamberto, is, is connected with uh, a family down there that, that produces and, and farms Espedin, and, and they had been reaching out to him. So that was kind of our, our initial ingress in, into the agave spirit. We, had, we really hadn't explored additional options at that time. You know, we had been building out tequila, looking at that market and, you know, kind of on an ancillary note and looking at, at mezcal and seeing that, that growth. So it was something that had been really interesting to us from from the initial start. Yeah. Did you, so when, when you, you mentioned that you were working at bourbon, what do you like about agave cocktails or agave spirits? Like the, the, it's just, it's, it's something, it's got this, this really unique fingerprint to me. And if, if you ask me the spirit or the two spirits that I feel like I have not been able to pin down as a person, it would be agave spirits and rums because there's just such a wide variety and they're so terroir driven in many cases. Um, so, so what did, what do you like about agave spirits and cocktails? Like from a, from, from like a drinker's perspective? Yeah, it's, I mean, they're incredibly versatile to work with, especially mezcal, you know, we're seeing, uh, like you're saying terroir driven or even the production styles. So you have these two levels of, of production notes that allow you to really integrate mezcal into several different tiers uh, of cocktails, whether it's, Substituting for tequila has kind of uh, an initial complexity for the smoke or a, a parallel profile with the peatiness of a scotch. So we're, it's a very complex, but yet integratable spirit. Yeah, I love that. I don't think I've ever really thought of that direct transatlantic line where it's like, yeah, or you can just sub it in for a scotch. <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> <It's> nonchalantly. <laughs> uh, wow. Okay. I love that. It's certainly a versatile spirit. Uh, that's that's what I like about um mezcal and, and tequila it, it, and i feel like for for home bartenders most of our audience there's there's a, a bit of a, an intimidation factor with that right because with that flexibility comes like a, a certain lack of constraints was there a particular style of service or a particular cocktail that that really got you into agave or mezcal yeah well we felt like there was a big gap in the market from doing a lot of our, our initial research and you know, we wanted uh, a mezcal that was a, approachable for consumers. You know, we were, you know, we, we saw mezcal initially ingressed at really high end cocktail bars where those bartenders were far more versed on the spirits that existed throughout the world. So they were the ones really getting exposure to mezcal and the customers that aligned with those um, establishments were the ones that were, were seeing mezcal. Whereas we wanted it, we wanted you know, the mass market to see mezcal. We wanted uh, people who were their neighborhood watering holes had, had mezcals and, and dive bars. So we, we really wanted to create a brand that aligned with the flavor profile, that aligned with the market segment that we were looking at. And that was um, an approachable mezcal that you weren't nervous to order. Right. I see Tito's vodka drinkers as like a perfect audience for that because they're people who have self-identified as desiring what is at least perceived as a higher quality product than just your rail, right? And, and yet, you know, there, there's still room to go up from, from you know, no offense, Tito, like no offense, <laughs> like you're doing fine. I'm sure you're not gonna yeah, take handcrafted, offense. Handcrafted. <laughs> yeah, sure. There's some hands involved at certain points, uh, but but like, but there's still, there's still room to grow there. And I feel like, um, you know, there's this concept uh, in a developmental psychology called the zone of proximal development. And it's a, it's a concept that we've co-opted for the podcast and we call it the zone of proximal drinking. It's this kind of like, you know, gradual slope of like, okay, like, all right. So like you've, you've migrated up from a well drink to maybe a specialized, like, you know, you're specifying your spirit, but really if you, if you zoom out and look at the grand scheme of where there is to go, you know, there, there's, there's more, there's more of the world to experience. And so I think, you know, this is, you know, while what you're telling me is like, you know, we wanted something easy to say, unintimidating, something that, that doesn't, you know, your, your bottle's very clean. Thank you. And it doesn't have like, it doesn't have like a whole bunch of crazy like stuff going on with it. Like it's, it's pretty straightforward. And I think that taking away some of that superstructure with, with the branding is like a, it's a way to say like, Hey, 
we've got a nice clear spirit here with with some some maximum some something maximized about it right yeah. before we even learn anything about it and i think that's i think that that really plays a cool role in the market right now because you're right uh mezcal went straight to craft and i, yeah. I can't really think of any other spirit that did that no no and that's what we said we always wanted to build a, an introductory mezcal so people who either had heard of it but hadn't tasted it or people who had had you know traumatic experiences with some of the you know, really high smoke profile or really high ABV contents where you know they could really see the spirit you know the complexities and the nuances that that go along with mezcal without you know I always get the you know, taste like a campfire aspects of mezcal so right. we, we were really looking for um, a clean introductory mezcal that we could release to to the population yeah and so you went about building this brand and so i feel like most people when they when they think of mezcal they think of you know uh, for better or for worse they they think of del Maguey, right because it's right, the yeah. big it's the most penetrated it's the biggest brand out there in terms of craft and that they've got the their single village offerings and this is obviously different in a number of ways and so i'm curious what it what it takes from both a business perspective but also like a you know, how do I reach out and touch a consumer kind of uh, mindset? Like, what does it take to build a Mezcal brand? Yeah, so it, it took us several years of traveling back and forth to Oaxaca just to build the flavor profile for what we were looking to release. Um, and then on the back end, you know, we, we, all the legal and aspects of the alcohol industry with that, that go along with that, I won't, I won't bore you with. Um, <laughs> but, but we interviewed and talked to a, a lot of people you know coming from coming from the industry we were able to i was able to reach out to a lot of other personas and, and get their inputs on, on building the brand you know some of some of the people who were bartending around the city were were initial inputs on, on the bottle the label and, and gave great feedback on, on the spirit you know, before we were even producing it we were, we were bringing in bottles and having some of the local bartenders taste and get a feel for 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 what we were building so it was an input from the bartenders as you know being the our kind of brand ambassadors to the market as well as some of the consumers that we were going around and talking to we wanted to to build something for them not try to f force a brand for what we felt mescal needed to be on them mm -hmm. so um it was a lot of inputs from from a wide range of people and i love so we were talking off air i love the fact that this is kind of like you're bringing this to dc yeah <laughs> yeah we're dc mescal which like is fantastic like, man yeah, like yeah. that's that's so thank good you, thank you uh, I had a, I had a great interview uh, with Robin Miller, who was formerly working at Espida. Yeah, yeah. Um, Robin. So so we've got some we've got some great uh, agave spirits bars here in DC, and you know like there's you know you're talking about like one that's just a couple blocks away from us here where right. we're sitting in Petworth. Um, that's exciting in and of itself. So like there's there's like a there's a at least for me we've got yeah. the listeners all over the the country all over the world but for DC it, you know the, again you're you're kind of filling you're not, not only are you filling the need of like an introductory mezcal you're filling a a need where it's like yeah let's let's represent this city let's bring something special to this city that's kind of like been a little bit crowdsourced based on what you're saying exactly. from some of the folks who are doing great things at the bars here in DC. So I love that. But what I'm also curious about is the particulars of the the sourcing and, and the production methods in Oaxaca. Yeah. Uh, because one of the things, uh, as you noted earlier about um, mezcal, is that it's super terroir driven, which means where it's grown matters, how long it's like how how long it's allowed to uh, to age matters. Now, of course, there's some like sub conversations mm -hmm. about sustainability we need right, to have with right. that. And then uh, just finally, like how it's treated by the mezcaleros. So, um, can, can you you mentioned that you, you took a bunch of trips down there? Can yeah. you can you tell people about the place, the land, the people? Because I feel like that's really integral to the story of mezcal. Yeah. First of all, if if anyone has a chance to travel to Oaxaca, I mean that is my favorite place in the world. If if you're looking for food, that is bar none. A great trip, it's really accessible. So, anyone has a chance to go down there and more than recommended um yeah we took uh, we took dozens of trips now down there to to kind of perfect what, what we were looking to build and and our partners down there you know while it looks like a simple mezcal there's a lot of complexity that goes into to driving this brand and as we'll taste in a little bit 
Um, but it's 100% espadine, so it's uh, an agave that grows readily easy. So it was something that, you know, the, the varieties of, of mezcals or of agave out there are, are all over the board. So we wanted something that, you know, was going to align with the flavor profile we were looking to build. And we grow 100% espadine on, on the facility um, down in Matatlan. But um, there's some traditional and in ancient production techniques that go into the producing mezcal. So we took a, a, a different rift on the production style and gave it a, a kind of modern approach you know, so while we roast in a traditional conical oven like most of you people are familiar with we we added a underground heat source which allows us to roast at a much lighter temperature than some of the other mezcals do so we're not burning the exterior of the pina which is allowing us to get a, a much more even caramelization on, on the pina so we'll taste it but you'll get this notes of sweetness without this really abrasive smoke profile that's really interesting um so if you go back to our interview with Eric Sandona uh, of the Tequila Dictionary, um, there's there's a couple of different, we'll call it heat introduction methods when it comes to agave. There's the the horno, the traditional oven, which you were describing. Then there's the the autoclave, which is essentially like this this big kind of pressure cooker. And then there's the infuser, I believe. Right. And so, so what you're kind of describing, I'm probably wrong here because I don't know anything, but what you're kind of describing like with, with more of this, like this, this more even heating due to the modified heat source is you're, you're almost fusing the traditional, like you're still getting the influence of the smoke, right? Of the traditional oven, but because you can control it and cook it a little bit more evenly, it's, it's, there's also more like in uh like autoclave style correct flavors yeah yeah and much more control over our temperature so you know, traditionally you have to roast the river rock or, or lava rock up to you know six or seven hundred degrees so that'll allow you to last the two or three days that you need to roast the pina and, and having it at that high temperature really burns and charcoals the exterior of the pina so a lot of mezcals have that high smoke profile from from that aspect but allowing us to roast or not even having to get to as high as a temperature with with those river rocks but allowing us to have a much more even roasting temperature doesn't burn the exterior of the pina but caramelizes um so you know we like to kind of equate it to barbecue you know it's this kind of cold yeah. smoking salmon versus you know underground pit roasting pulled pork so it's you know so many different aspects you can you can take into to barbecue that you know sometimes the smoke profile on on Texas barbecue is is too much for people but sometimes you know they like pressure cooked pulled pork. Yeah, I mean you you were just you were you were like you were looking at me. I was just sitting here grinning because I was like waiting for you to finish, and I was gonna go into a barbecue analogy, which is perfect, right? Because some people don't want like you know that Texas brisket. That's exactly what I was thinking when you were you know describing the, the difference between like heating up that lava rock to this insanely high temperature. Some people like to cut through a half three quarters of an inch of char. Yeah, yeah. Some you know I can go either way. Like sometimes I'm in the mood for that. You know, to be honest, but like sometimes same way with mezcal. Yeah, sometimes I'm not. Like there's, oh, that is so cool. I don't, I don't think I've ever like really sat with that meat analogy. That's awesome. That's yeah. like completely awesome. And I think that's a perfect way to describe agave to people because it's like, to be honest, it's, it's a bit of a foreign process to most people, right? Because 100%. these agave pinas are giant, especially with espadine. Yeah. They're, they're big yeah. boys. Yeah. Like they yeah. are like rugby ball. Pounds, yeah. yeah. Rugby ball plus like yeah. they're. Gigante, yeah. uh, Maximo, one yeah. might say. Um, <laughs> but yeah, wow, that is so cool. Uh, did now has anyone given you any? It doesn't seem like you would get regulatory pushback for that, but it does seem like you're kind of pushing the boundaries between what a traditional horno is and something that's maybe more high tech. Have you gotten any pushback? I'm just curious. No, a couple other brands have kind of adopted this production style. So we're, we're seeing in market, but no, it technically falls under the, the traditional ancestral production technique but definition. Just, yeah. But you just made just it a little. You just, just optimized just an it. Just additional, yeah, it's just an additional step we added in to... Um, to help with production. That's cool. Does that help with output at all? 
No, it's still it's just a different temperature that that we're roasting at. It's mm-hmm. um, you know still the same time that it, that it roasts for. It's just at, at a different temperature. Yeah, so, or, or different levels of temperature. You know, it's kind of the the exponential decrease of of heat versus kind of this you know, even. I guess it's like rabbit versus hair analogy. Like you can start off really high and then their you know, kind of river rock goes to very a really yeah. low temperature and right. you know, we kind of stay at this even keel yeah. temperature throughout the the process so the slow cooker yeah yeah, yeah i love yeah. it I just, of it. Yeah. I just made some yeah. my wife just made this amazing slow cooker it's like a Ghanaian dish it's called uh, ground nut soup it's like i can it's, smell it it's chicken <laughs> it tomatoes good. and it's interestingly like peanut butter huh can you believe it wow. it's and it's like my favorite thing that she makes it's incredible <laughs> Yeah. Oh, by the way, we're totally in a studio right now, not my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So uh, we've got a really good uh, we've got a really good sense, I think, of some of the production methods. Uh, a lot of what makes uh, Maximo special, I think, with the the production methods. So I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour us some samples of this. And can you talk a little bit about maybe the terroir in terms of um, the location, perhaps the elevation, uh, it, it soil type, uh, the the uh, mescalera, and maybe all of those details aren't available to you. But like w- w- for what you know about the terroir, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. So I- I'm sure you've heard, but a-, a lot of the industry is kind of in flux. A majority of brands, albeit tequila as well, are are sourcing agave. Um, you know, we own. All of our land down there so we oversee the entire production facility from from growth to harvest to fermentation to distillation so it's it's nice for us to oversee all the aspects going into to the mezcal where you know we're really starting to see some some pricing influx and some demand generation from some of the mescaleros down in, in mexico right now with because it takes anywhere from seven to ten years based on rainfall and heat and humidity that goes into the ability to harvest espadine so it's it's something that wasn't as planned for with the you know real big increase in, in demand in the u.s so you know we're starting to see some 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 pricing quality decreases coming out of kind of out of oaxaca but we're about an hour south of oaxaca city um in, in the highlands there about 160 hectares of land it's all 100 percent espadine which is you know one of the dozens of different agave varietals that you can produce mezcal with we'd like to equate mezcal and tequila with whiskey and bourbon you know tequila is this hyper subset of mezcal whereas bourbon is this hyper regulated subset of of whiskey so i think people kind of think mezcal is you know the brother of tequila or, or some right they think they're, they're on, associated think they're on the same level yeah, but yeah, really but there's there's really, a lot more diversity yeah, kind of this overarching <laughs> aspect of mezcal so that that plays a lot you know humidity plays a huge role in in the amount of time that we're able to ferment and distill and, and rainfall as well so the, those are all kind of factors that we look into whether it's you know how how quickly we're able to harvest the espadine to how quickly we can ferment and how long that takes um, for those aspects, so there's there's a lot of different factors that that play a role in in kind of the the production facility. So I mean, everyone down there is is handcrafting mezcal, so they uh, you know kind of all influx to these these different kind of terroir aspects. Right, and and what you're mentioning right now is actually one of my favorite aspects of mezcal, uh, which is the the fermentation. So, uh, but I find I find that fermentation, you know, the, like the traditional the traditional wisdom is that that the primary flavor of what you get from a distilled spirit in most cases is the is due to the fermentation and then the mm-hmm. the distillation focuses that so why don't we uh, give this a nose and and a taste and then while i'm nosing this uh would you mind talking a little bit more about the fermentation because i know that mezcal is traditionally like open air fermented yeah. yeah so we are open air natural fermentation so you know like i said humidity plays a huge role um in kind of whether expediting or, or we slowing or slowing that process so yeah, uh, time is like it, length. Like, is there like a length that you typically aim for? I know you said that, that the humidity kind of plays a role in that, but is yeah, there around, something you shoot for? Seven to ten days, depending on on humidity, we'll we'll let it ferment for, and those are in you know hundred fifty gallon oak oak bats. That okay, I'll, I'll sit in. Nice. I wish I could show the um, 
the listeners some some pictures of of our facility down there. Really cool. Well, we'll get some on the show notes page. We publish this, and and we'll um. So, so what? Yeah, what is the facility like? Because I, I imagine there's probably a wide range of, of facilities down there, and it, it seems like the it seems like based on the way you're describing the the, the oven, it seems like you're really invested in it so that it is sustainable and so that you can continue to produce this really consistent product. Yeah, definitely. It's um you know kind of this really cool mission style and initial facility where where all the offices are held. And, and everything else is open air. We, the kind of production facility is out in in in, um, in the field, so it's a little bit of a, a jeep drive to get out there. And you know, open air, everything's surrounded. You got a, a tasting room. We like to take people down and kind of drive through the lands, get to see the plots that we have rotating, and then kind of end up in this center of the fields where where our distillation facility is. Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, it sounds like. It reminds me of kind of like the way that, that the Virginia wine country kind of grew up where it's exactly. like you're you're tasting your wine and you're just like right out there. You're like yeah. looking, you're like staring the vines in the face, yeah. which is totally great. Like it gets people so into it and it like really, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you see, uh, you know, what happened in Kentucky and it's like it's kind of the, the corn arrives yeah yeah <laughs> and, that season but but in but in oaxaca it's like no, no there's the guy it's like right yeah, there yeah like you're walking through driving it right over it yeah or driving right through it right yeah. right yeah. yeah so initial notes on this i definitely get like i'm, I'm getting not a not a briny in like a sea brine kind of way but i'm getting like a like a nice bit of of, of salinity like on the nose with some of those really pleasant like graham cracker notes. Um, not yeah. not like not like you would expect from a reposado tequila per se. Right. But but something where it's like it's like oh there's sugar in here and I think that's something that sometimes you know talking about those mezcals that come out more like that Texas brisket. It's like yeah. it tastes like just it's hot and smoky and and in your face and this it's like oh no this is this is a little bit. A little gentler. Yeah, we're kind of going for like a lemon meringue where you kind of get the citrus and spice, yeah. but it's this like smoother, deeper. It kind sweetness. of smells a little bit like a martini. Yeah. Like it, like a good, you know, like express the twist. Like it's, it's definitely it's lemon, nice. definitely lemon. And I can see like the sweetness from the meringue a little bit. Whoo, that's exciting. But we didn't want this really aggressive nose. So it's it's a much lighter and you can kind of get that you can kind of feel that abv and you know that we sit at at 40 percent alcohol by content or or 80 proof right um because we wanted something that was adaptable or not too abrasive right yeah and i mean the trend these days is in many cases to go hot um and it has become i what i'd compare that to is the uh crazy ipa trend like how hoppy Uh, can i get it right like um so you know mo you'll sit there on reddit or a a specialized facebook group for whiskey whiskey nerds and they're like oh i just got this cast strength just got this cask strength and it's like okay um i love a good cast strength but i also love just a great approachable something that's sitting right at 40 And, and it's like to me like it's it's almost like a constant that because so many spirits, especially if you look at the world of like Irish whiskeys, brandies, vodka, stuff like that, uh, even j- like a lot, like mo- uh, many gins, like they're sitting right at 40. And so when I when I get a 40 percent ABV or an 80 proof spirit, it actually gives me a larger bank of experiences that I can draw on to kind of compare it to. And it's not that I can't compare this to like hotter, hotter spirits in its category. But the funny thing is, when I get something that's right at 80 proof, I can compare it to pretty much anything else that's exactly. at 80 proof. So let me let me take a take a, a little sip. So you'll get the citrus up front, and then you'll feel this lingering heat. Wow. I get like black pepper, um, but like not, how do I describe, wow. And the finish is awesome. Thank you, thank you. That's like, it's it's got this cool gradient, right? And and um, it's actually on the palate, it's a little warmer than I might expect a 40% spirit to be, but I sort of attribute that to the fact that it's mezcal, and mezcal always has this warming characteristic. So, you know, I think one of the big victories of this, just having taken one sip, is that you achieve that traditional mezcal thing, but 
traditional mezcal is coming off at like 45, 48, 50 percent, right. maybe more. You got that, but it's so approachable from like a, you know, you could pour this for a whiskey drinker or a rum drinker or something like that. And it's still got that approachability factor without losing its identity, which I think is what most people who sit, who, who walk up to me and say like, listen, I want to make an introductory X. That's what they lose because right. in, in order to make an introductory X, they end up lopping off all of those identifiable characteristics exactly, yeah. and then like juxtaposition. And then you just turn out with like a, a bland product. And this, this is, it's, the, so cool because it's approachable, but it it's not losing any of that differentiation or that identity that makes it mezcal. Thank yeah. you, thank you. That's that's what we were really trying to build. You know, we didn't want the branding to kind of take away from the complexity and and the handcrafting that goes into to building the spirit and and the taste profile within. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about cocktails in a second, but um, can you can you talk a little bit about how this product has been received, kind of what you've been up to in the process of evangelizing it and getting it into um, to bars and liquor stores uh, around here? Yeah, definitely. So it's this kind of double-edged sword. It takes a lot of education to walk people through the complexity of the mezcal because I think when people look for mezcal, they look for you know the glass or clay bottle with a lot of kitschy outlaw Mexican branding on there. So it's it's taken a big education standpoint to walk people through the process, you know, how it's vertically integrated, the flavor profile, and that we're not trying to take away from the spirit by producing a, a simple bottle or, or label that we just want people to, to be receptive to the brand. So, you know, we, we have our, our target account base and you know, maybe we're not geared at some of the, the really highly curated mezcal bars and maybe you know, the neighborhood bars are, are, are more for our clientele but people have been receiving it fantastic from from all over the place because it's got the kind of in-depth handcrafting that goes into a really complex mezcal without the kitschiness and it also has the approachability and and um, flavor profile that a lot of the lower end but a lot of the kind of larger volume accounts can can really begin to integrate this with yeah and the cool thing is this is and this is like a little nerdy secret you can tell that bartenders had input on this because <laughs> pick it up <laughs> because there's a neck and they can grab it right from the speed rack and yeah. if it's on the speed rack it means it's in cocktails which is huge yeah. for turnover and for just like get like spreading exposure, the word yeah, yeah, yeah exposure and turnover right so that's great and then <clears throat> one of the little hacks I learned or like little little insider tips when it comes to agave spirits is the more expensive or fancy the bottle the less the the lesser relative quality the the stuff inside because you're paying more not I'm not saying it's bad necessarily but the, you're paying more for the bottle than you are for this the stuff that's inside exactly. uh so I love a simple mezcal bottle I love that it's clean yeah. and I, I trust it more. I just do. Like when I see these fancy bottles, like, you know, nothing against Milagro because they've got, you know, they, they've yeah. got plenty of money to buy a bazillion bottles. So, so they're, you know, they're, they're factoring that in, in a different way than, than most smaller companies. But like, you know, when I see fancy bottles with crowns and just crazy stuff, stuff that you, you know, get, that's it's locked famous. up behind glass at Costco, <laughs> it's like, all right, well, it's locked up behind glass because of the glass, not because of the juice in here. You know, the, the, essentially what I'm saying is there's a clear focus. Um, yeah, it's always been on the juice, and you know, we'll, we'll work on the labeling and bottling as, as we get traction. This is problematic because, like, once this is gone, I'm probably going to, like, spring for, like, half a case or something. <laughs> like, this is, That's yours. This is, like, a regular sipper. Um, two, uh, like I, I wouldn't feel bad, like, like going through this at a faster clip than I might something that was, you know, like for example, the Delmi Gay single village that I'm paying like $120 a bottle for, um, which brings me to the question of like, uh, what's the, the price point at liquor stores? We do have a lot of bartenders in DC who listen to this show. So like, what are they, you know, like where, like 
like what maybe you don't have to like get into wholesale price points, but like what is a, a comparable like spirit that they might be able to compare this to at price point from from a distributor from direct from you? Yeah, so we sit at a shelf price um, anywhere from thirty nine ninety nine to forty two. Mm-hmm. Um, we we really wanted something sub forty. We feel like to make a snap mezcal purchase anything over forty five is really tough and requires a, a lot of sales process to to really introduce people to to that brand so we wanted to be right at forty dollars for for our customers and in terms of bars and restaurants i mean it it's 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 right where kind of anything local is produced you know whether it's you know, cotton and reed 1a and all, all those guys because sure. sit at the same price point for for them and that's huge yeah yeah because well, you're trying to be like the local force exactly in that. exactly yeah so we we are our own importers so we set up an import company and we, so essentially we see the entire process from field to to a bottle and you know we're even technically dc distributors so when we got started i was selling this out of out of my truck you know making deliveries you know, to you know, a little over a year ago now um was driving up here to mezcalero dropping off getting them to sign papers and and on to the next and just doing drop-offs all day nice uh so if you uh, were to leave a note to the DC bartenders who are listening right now, where would you um, recommend they try and pick this up? In terms of liquor stores? Or, or just oh, oh, uh, yeah, kind of like distribute? Like, oh, are so, you... Yeah, we're with Craft One and Spirits uh, in DC. Tom's, everyone knows Tom. He's he's all over the city. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so they've been a great distributor for us. Perfect. Yeah, they, yeah. they really are, are into curating a, a, a craft portfolio and, you know, I've had great input for you know how how we can build as, as a company and how you know to even market ourselves to the bartenders in, in the city and, and in Maryland and Delaware where they distribute as well. So they've been they've been a huge help. Absolutely. So let's talk cocktails and, and hit a few lightning rounds. Yeah. Perfect. Cocktails with mezcal. It doesn't have its cocktail. You know, tequila's got the margarita. You know, everything else seems to have its cocktail. Yeah. What's the deal with mezcal cocktails? It's I think it's still starting to to grow in demand in in the states, and now that bartenders all over the country are, are becoming more and more progressive with how they implement that into cocktails, um, I, I'm hoping we'll see one soon. I like the comment earlier about it's it's basically a transatlantic swap out for Scotch, um, and yet. I don't know if this would fit that bill. It's definitely got the smoke. It's got a little bit of that smoke. If I had to compare this to a Scotch region, what would I compare it to? It's not an Isla. It's mm-hmm. not like the crazy, like salty briny. It's, and yet it doesn't have, you know, I'd say that this is probably more of like a Highland yeah. style. It's not, you know, it doesn't have those like, you know, I mean, maybe if you stuck this in a barrel. Uh, this could have some, you know, some space side characteristics with some of those fruitier notes. Um, but, but I think this is, much, you know, if you, if, if you were going to, you know, put this in a cocktail, you know, like a blood and sand, I okay. could, I could certainly yeah. see this, you know, anything else where you would normally look for one of those more Highland scotch profiles. And I think of the Highland scotches as one of the more balanced when it comes to like now, now balance, I think. Like space side is technically the most balanced because it's just sitting there and just like macerating oh, right, in fruit juices. Right. But if you take those like fruit juices out of it, out of the yeah. equation, then Highland is kind of the most versatile and balanced style of scotch. And so I think any time, like if you're looking for like a Maximo Mezcal uh, swap out with scotch, I would go for something like a cocktail where you might be looking for a Highland uh, or even maybe okay. something like a monkey shoulder. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. monkey shoulder has kind of prided itself on being the blend of single malt. Yeah. And I, I, I almost take a, a similar kind of fingerprint from the Maximo because it, it's got such versatility. But but again, like I was mentioning earlier, it doesn't lose that distinct fingerprint. So um, but then, you know, like with the sweetness in this and, and we're, we're going to try and, and put together a, a cocktail video here uh, to launch in conjunction with this episode. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking, you know, because of the balance with this. I, I don't necessarily want to just throw citrus juice at it. Right. And and I Which is the default. Right. Well, you've got the margarita format, right? Because as soon as somebody thinks scotch, they're like, okay, scotch, agave, agave, margarita. Yeah. Or paloma. paloma. 
amazing cocktails both but with this i kind of want to stir it i don't necessarily need to shake it because there's mm-hmm. there's good body here and i'm just i'm 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 just intrigued picturing like a bunch of pulled pork at the bottom of my glass right now it's just so tender and so ju- it's like it's 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 really rich right sazerac was one of the first cocktails i was exposed to when I, when i moved to dc for the first time and you know that was one of the first cocktails i made back at the house when we got maximo in um so i love it in a sazerac i love it in a stirred manhattan you know yeah. it really kind of adds oh depth yeah without kind of the overpowering smoke that you kind of equate with mezcal yeah, I think that might be it. I think it might be a Mezcal Manhattan that we feature because I've got I some Carpano it. Antica in the fridge, which is not always what I have in the fridge, to be fair. <laughs> Podcasting pays great. No, it doesn't. Um, okay, no so, <laughs> so yeah, so I, I think uh, takeaway is like, yes, this is a sipper and it's a and it's a boozy stirrer. And certainly, I mean, all, all agave spirits can handle citrus. Like that's the beauty of them. Yeah. That's that's their like that's their main jam. But I think that there's more that can be done with this. So exactly. very very cool. So lightning round. First question: What's your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite of all time, what's something you've been most recently obsessed with? So I just mentioned, but Sazerac is my favorite. That was my introduction to craft cocktails at Bourbon in Glover Park. Um, so I've always had this affinity from having to make that, you know, thirty forty times a night, and then you know, kind of blew my mind how complex a, a cocktail could be with such simple ingredients. So I've always had a, a love for Sazeracs in my heart. Um, I live down in Old Town, Alexandria now, so John Shot over at uh, the People's Drug makes an amazing strawberry painkiller with Maximo Mezcal. Well, where's the yeah. strawberry come in? So he infuses the Maximo with strawberry. Oh, oh my man. God. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's fantastic. Cream. Yeah, it's... It's dangerous. We'll we'll sit there and have a, three or four of those, and <clears throat> we'll be Ubering home. So you like so you like a little bit of the licorice stuff then, because like both the painkiller and the Sazerac have absinthe. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, that's I think interesting. Bitters really align with with those aspects of, of mezcal. It can really kind of elevate the the complexity and kind of granular aspects of despedine. Yeah, for sure. Wow. Okay. Got a strawberry painkiller. That it's, sounds, that's, it's, it's one of those, it's one of those situations where if I saw that on a menu, I'd be like, all right, like <laughs> yeah. it's over. Not, yeah. Not, not my dinner drink, but, uh, definitely my after dinner drink. Yeah. We're, we're doing, yeah, that, I would go hard on that. Wow. Um, if you were a cocktail ingredient, what would you be and why? Cocktail ingredient. I would have to say, mint whoa mint that is great Uh fresh fun (laughs) vibrant you know i don't think anyone's sad having a a mojito or anything with mint in it that's a good side yeah no one's no one's no one's sad having having those cocktails so that would be another great use for this the south side because like Although although citrus wouldn't be my first go to, if I did add citrus, I would say lemon. Okay. And then the mint kind of blends into that kind of licorice affinity that I think this spirit has. Yeah, South Side would be like, yo, yeah, that would be that'd be fantastic. There was this event. Um, they called the South Side Steaks a couple a couple years ago. I believe that's a Baltimore cocktail. I believe so. And so there was this awesome event where a bunch of bartenders um, got up there and and just made a bunch of like crazy different South Side. So for folks at home, actually, here's a great cocktail challenge for you. If you're getting a little bit bored with like your normal sour cocktails, if you like sour cocktails and, and you're looking for maybe a new spin, the South Side is another one of those formats where it's like really flexible and you can kind of put your own fingerprints on it, but it's also like kind of close it's 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 right between a julep and a sour right you're like you've got your sour cocktail you throw that mint in there and it's like refreshing great for the tail end of the summer if you get like one of those hot days in the fall you can still totally get away with this outside yeah mint i love that yeah so another aspect that, that we kind of didn't touch on but we've seen a lot of cocktails substitute out mezcal for gin so you know there's kind of that same aspect that you get with the juniper that that you can see with mezcal so that's kind of a, a lot of or i've seen around the city you know uh, we were over at left door a couple of weeks ago and they have um a last word with mezcal mm-hmm. so it's really starting to integrate with gin as well 
Yeah, last of the Walkins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I love it. Um, before before I tasted it, that was going to be what I was going to uh, feature feature for this, but I think I might take a different route now. <laughs> um, Back to the books. Exactly. Um, all right, here's the Widowmaker question. Cocktail with anybody, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just paint us a picture. Yeah, so one of the first books I read um, after beginning working in... in uh, Finn's Fish House down in Dewey was a book called Setting the Table by Danny Meyer and it kind of blew my mind how he took such a different approach to being a restaurateur. I mean, I think when we think or imagine restaurateur, he's not someone that, that we imagine. He's taken such kind of a, a different approach and hospitality approach to the industry and it's you know something that we've tried to embody in, in the brand that you know, as we release, how, how can we become approachable and, and kind of align with the values that he's instilled in, in his group? Um, so I would love to have you know, a nice Manhattan with him at a really fancy New York hotel bar and just pick his brain on how he built what he's built. Well, he's opening uh, a restaurant here in D.C., so well, maybe it'll be a fancy DC hotel bar uh-huh. then. Yeah, it's right on. It's going to be, uh, I believe, on the wharf uh, as part of one of the new hotels that are going up there on the wharf. So um, I don't know. Let's see. I'll uh, maybe maybe I'll uh, cut out this clip, and next yeah. time I email with one of those folks, then uh, maybe we'll see if we can get shameless uh, plug. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Danny Meyer, uh, fantastic uh, case study for people who are looking at like what's been going on with the restaurant industry or the hospitality industry in general over the past decade, decade and a half. Uh, Gramercy Tavern um, or Gramercy, like the Gramercy, whatever the Gramercy group is. They've got a a bunch of different properties in New York. Um, He's been on the Tim Ferriss podcast. Uh, As I mentioned, he's he's opening his first restaurant here in D.C., which is going to be an Italian uh, concept uh, down by the wharf. So, uh, yeah, like Shake Shack, Shake Shack. And he's he's just a, a monster. Right. Really good answer. I love when people um, pick people who are still alive because the 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 temptation is to be like Mark Twain. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about going the mid century Paris route. Right. Yeah. That, that there's there's so many temptations in the past, but I love I love the present day because there's always the possibility. Right. <laughs> All right. Getting into more of the advicey stuff. Any books about mezcal or spirits and cocktails in general that were particularly influential to you uh, as you as you made your way through the industry and started this brand? Yeah, definitely. So a couple of mezcal books, um, Finding Mezcal by Ron Cooper, um, who runs Selma you know, a great kind of picture of what kind of traveling through Mexico is, the food, the experience, building the brand, the the people of Mexico. Um, it, it's a great book to read and, you know, kind of underlines mezcal as well. So, mm-hmm. you know, incredibly in depth in, in terms of information um, if you're looking to learn more about the spirit. And then also mezcal by, um, by Emma Jensen mm-hmm. um, is, is another great book. Um, you know, kind of really really in depth on the industry and thoughts on, on mezcal and Mexico as a whole, um, you know, are, are two great books if you're looking to um, learn more about the spirit. Right, right. And uh, Thad Vogler has a, a pretty good chapter in uh, uh, By the Smoke and the Smell on his travels to Oaxaca as well. Um, did, that's more of like a travelogue all over the world. But uh, um, yeah, Ron Cooper, super, super influential. Uh, he said that mezcal is liquid art. He's kind of like an art guy. So I, I imagine I, I actually have not gotten around to that book, but uh, it's definitely on my list. So we'll, we'll put uh, links to those books up on the show notes page over at modernbarcart.com, as well as a link to our book review of By the Smoke and the Smell, where you can find that chapter on uh, the Oaxaca experience. Um, do you have any advice for folks who are looking to get into agave spirits in general or mezcal in particular? Because as we mentioned, we've been talking about this the whole time. It's a tricky category, yeah. but it's so it exciting. And so I feel like I, I feel like I need advice. I feel like I'm always looking for guidance about how to more intelligently or how to like just better get myself acquainted with these really diverse spirits. Yeah, uh, the best way is to ask your local bartender. I mean, the bartenders are, you know, part artist, part salesperson, part hospitality. Yeah. Um, so you know, they they love making cocktails, but they could talk about the spirit and everything behind it and the rationale behind building it for days and days. 
Um, and you know, that's their, their craft is, is learning and learning everything there is to know about as many spirits as they can. So, you know, even from going into some of the highly curated mezcal bars like Espita or Mescalero over here and, and talking with them about mezcal and your flavor profile or some of the spirits that you drink and you know, how you can transition into the spirit, you know, they're always more than, more than welcome to walk people through. Yeah. And I mean, the other, the other good thing about that is like, if you need an excuse to drink on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, <laughs> like that's when you get to have those conversations with them, right? Like maybe, maybe not like Friday happy hour. Like that's not the time when you're going to be able to get like the whole treatise on like exactly. this single village bottle. However, <laughs> if you go in on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, that's when you're going to be able to actually form relationships with these people. And especially like if you have a project, if your project is to learn about Mezcal or learn about agave spirits, then you know, like timing, timing is an important part of that. And like people here in DC, I think have been doing a better job embracing more of like the day drinking culture, like doing, like yeah, drinking yeah. smarter, to be honest. Exactly. And I, I, like, it sounds weird, but like, you know, having one or two on a Tuesday or a Wednesday is like kind of a part of that conversation. It like is. most people view it like, oh, you're drinking on a Tuesday. Like, yeah. like, no, like that's a great time to go in, like have a couple and actually get some time with the stuff in the glass and the person who's pouring it because that's how you're going to learn the most. Yeah, that's the quickest and cheapest way. I mean, some of the bottles in, in liquor stores will run you north of $100. And, you know, I, I would sit in there and watch people look at the Mezcal wall at batch 13 with just... Oof blank stairs and no idea where to go and no no direction so having reaching out to your local bartender and having them walk you through kind of some some brands that you feel like you they might or that they feel you might like or you know, different aspects different different kind of avenues or, or cocktails that you can make at home with with relative ease is, is a great way to to really get an ingress into the spirit yeah for sure um so john this has been amazing Th- what cool juice, what cool perspectives. Um, really appreciate you coming in and sharing all this with us. Can you share uh, where to best get in touch with Maximo uh, or with you digitally, social media, all that stuff? Yeah, I run our Maximo Instagram and by no way know what I'm doing, but I spend <laughs> way too much time on it. So um, that is the quickest way to get to me. And we're just at Maximo Mescal. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. And uh, website? Maximo Mescal as well. MaximoMescal.com. Perfect. Keep it nice and simple. Right. And you get some beautiful, beautiful video on there. Like a really good, it's it's like a really great breakdown of like um, like the, the story behind the spirit and, and all that. So yeah, we're trying to build out a, a platform where you know, people can really go to learn the initial basics of, of Mescal. So when you go to have that initial talk with your bartender, you're, you're still not nervous, even, even though you, you know, it's shouldn't be a, a nervous or intimidating process but it still is though it right is. it still it is. is uh well uh, i still get nervous after after a couple uh after a couple nips of this i think everything gets just a little bit better so uh <laughs> john thanks so much again and hopefully we can uh, come back from around two at some point my pleasure thank you for having me here Hey everybody, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out 
for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, excellent innovative mezcal courtesy of John Ravis and Maximo Mezcal, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2019.